we might be a little short today in my shirt. Certainly, my lesson didn't turn out the way I was planning for it, but Lord knows all about that. So, we'll go to Romans chapter 6. <coughs> you recall previously, we finished up in chapter 5 and started on chapter 6. And we saw that the, the law showed us our exceeding sinfulness, but how that God and His grace is far greater than us in our sin. And then the focus kind of changes to more how that we should live now that we are saved. <coughs> we'll pick up <coughs> here in verse 2. The second half of that verse really he says, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In verse 3, you know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Amen. Now I started studying this and I tended to get much farther than that. <clears throat> I spent a lot of time thinking on baptism when I came to verse 3. So. But he begins here by saying, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You notice that phrase, that are dead to sin, is, is in between two commas. I mean, it's, it's a relative clause of what the English grammar calls it. It gives us additional information about the subject, and that is we, we the saved. And he says that we are dead to sin. Amen. We, with that information, he asked the question, how shall we live any longer therein? How shall we that have died to sin live in a life of sin? Mm -hmm. Really, it's not compatible with the life of a Christian to continue on in a life of sin after God has saved you. Oh, as I mentioned last time, it doesn't mean we're, not going, we're never going to sin again, or we're not going to struggle sometimes with those sinful tendencies because we still have the flesh to deal with. But, but for example, the drunk that is saved, he, if he has never changed from his drunken ways, then I don't think he's ever experienced the grace of God. Right? We all have some sort of vice, I would say, that plagues us. The sin that does so easily beset us, he describes it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we all struggle with that from time to time. We don't just live openly in sin anymore if we've been truly saved. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. The only possible example I see of that was the prodigal son. And he, you see how that worked out for him. He got down as low as he could go. Right. And he said, oh, i got to go back to my father's house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can get out and sin as the people of God, but you can be sure if you're one of his, he will chastise you and <clears throat> cause us to repent and return back to him. Mm -hmm. The only other thing I see in scripture is that if you don't repent, he can just remove you. Mm -hmm. I think Adam has made mention of that. If we're not a useful vessel, he's able to take us out of here. Mm -hmm. so, a life of sin is not characteristic of a child of God. That's why Paul says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And that dead to sin is kind of the focus of the next several verses. Verse 3, he says, no you not. This is a phrase often used by Paul. Back 12 out of 17 times you'll find the scripture, it's Paul writing. And he uses it somewhat sarcastically, kind of like, don't y'all know? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like you should know this, but oftentimes who he's writing to is ignorant of it for various reasons. But he says, "Know you not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, well, there's a lot of confusion on what it means to be baptized into Christ. Mm -hmm. so there are some today that." Make this a, a spiritual baptism and equate it to salvation. And this is where oftentimes where the mystical universal invisible church comes in. Right. Because that's the only way to reconcile that is if we're, if we're all baptized into Christ and we're all part of that invisible church. But without getting on 
what the church is. We know it's a called out assembly is what the word church means. But, right. Uh, but we see in Scripture there are only ever two baptisms of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. One is in Acts chapter 2 and came down like a mighty rushing wind and was upon the apostles there and they spoke in tongues and not the gibberish that the charismatics do today. Right. They spoke in they just really all they did was speak and everyone heard in their own tongue. That was the miracle. That's all right. Amen. And then we see that happened once again in Acts chapter 10. That was really because of the stubbornness of Peter. It was God showing Peter that yes, even the Gentiles could be saved. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit fell upon them and he said, well, who shall forbid water if these should be baptized even as we? Mm -hmm. That's the same place where God had given them the vision of the, the sheep that came down with the animals and he said he wasn't going to eat because it wasn't clean. <clears throat> Peter's hard-headedness oftentimes got him in trouble, but it oftentimes gives us good examples too. Right. But outside of those two instances, you don't see a, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul writes for us that there is one Lord, one baptism, or one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Amen. But will this here to be baptized into Christ? I think it does refer to water baptism. But just because someone is, quote, baptized doesn't mean they were baptized into Christ. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of people that have been dunked under who never had a real profession of faith. Right. There's lots of people today who trust that baptism will save them. And that was not the purpose of baptism. So that's where I was thinking about what is baptism. We don't, we don't talk about it a whole lot in Baptist churches for some reason. Of course, there's not a whole lot of scriptures that define what it is, and we have a lot of scriptures that give us examples of it. But the word baptism means to immerse or to dip, to make fully wet. Right. And the more old English words, it means to make well, which is to be buried or engulfed. Mm hmm well, that excludes sprinkling and pouring and any such thing as that. Amen. You know, I've <coughs> my fair share of funerals and I've never seen them sprinkle dirt on top of the casket. Right. Yeah. You know, there was a good six feet of dirt put there on them. Mm hmm you know, And that day when they buried someone, they put them in a tomb and sealed it with the stone. They were completely engulfed, if you will, in that tomb. But to make baptism a, a sprinkling or a pouring or any such thing would be like to lay your loved one out there and just pitch a shovel of dirt on them. Right. I know that's why some people have a, a problem with the term baptize and baptism because it's a transliteration rather than a literal translation. But you know, to me, it's not that difficult to know what words mean. Right. We also know from Scripture that Baptism is for those who believe. It's the greatest example of that is found in Acts chapter 8. We don't have to turn there, but Acts 8, when the Ethiopian eunuch was coming to worship, and remember Philip met him there, mm -hmm. preached to him the gospel out of Isaiah 53. Acts 8, 35 through 38 records an instance where he believed, and then he says, well, here is water, but it's going to be baptized. No. Philip didn't say, okay, we'll get down here and baptize and you'll be saved. No, he said, if thou believest, thou mayest be baptized. Amen. Yeah. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Belief, faith, if you will, always has to proceed being dunked under the water. Amen. No. We'll say something that's going to sound controversial, but it's what the scripture says it does say in 1 Peter 3 4 that baptism saves us. Mm -hmm. It is not the salvation of our souls. If you read the whole entire verse there, it says 
that it saves us not to put it away the filth of the flesh, but to answer with a good conscience towards God. Right. Amen. You know, I've tried to discuss that with people who believe baptism or regeneration, and they just, I know they're blinded, and they just cannot see that. Not to put it away the filth of the flesh means it's not the salvation of the soul. Amen. There's a lot of debate about what he, Peter meant exactly there. But I think the biggest thing to take away from that whole scripture is he is using baptism as a figure, and the ark was a type of baptism, or the flood really was a type of baptism. The ark was Christ, and no one his family were already in the ark when they were pro baptized in the flood. Mm -hmm. Just as one must be already in Christ before they should be baptized in the New Testament way. If I understand 1 Corinthians 12, 13, right? Baptism is the means by which we are placed into the body of Christ, which is the church. And there are some people who say they take that to be a spiritual baptism, and that means that all are in this universal, invisible church. But Paul is speaking specifically to the church at Corinth there. Mm -hmm. And they were all members of that one body. This is we here are all members of this one body. But here he says that for as many or that so many of us as were baptized in Jesus Christ. That is you know, there were most likely some there that had been baptized, but they had not been baptized into Christ. Mm -hmm. so the Roman church had its problems and I don't know how long it took for some to split off or the whole church to defect but you know at some point along the way the Catholic church was formed out of this particular church mm -hmm. so just because someone has been baptized doesn't mean they've ever they've been truly baptized in the scriptural way you're right, amen it doesn't mean they've been truly baptized into Christ. There's lots of people who have gotten wet over the years. We're never true believers to begin with. Right. Well, it's not up to me to determine who those are and who those aren't. I've seen many, many times those who profess Christ, they're baptized, and shortly they disappear and you never see them again. Right. I have a huge question about those types of people. Amen. Because grace that saves us is a grace that is, is the same grace that is to change us and change our lives and live for Christ. No, he says here that we're baptized into Jesus Christ. Baptism is really a type of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We'll see that in the next several verses when we get into that. But we don't literally die and resurrect, but in Christ as our as our representative head, we die and are resurrected again, aren't we? Amen. You know, it's an outward show of this death, burial, and resurrection that we experience in Christ. He said we were baptized into his death. It is by baptism we are identified with his death, and really in it we die to sin. That when Christ died for our sin, and we are saying that we are dying to sin in Christ. Mm -hmm. I know some people might think that baptism is just some ritual that we do. I'm sure to the carnal mind, it just looks like, well, they're just dunking people in water. That's the purpose of that. But mm -hmm. well, certainly, baptism does not save us. And then I don't think it imparts grace to us, because I don't think grace can be earned, but there is some special thing that happens in, in baptism that the mm -hmm. Lord is pleased with. Amen. For even Christ was baptized, and he said it, he did it to fulfill all righteousness. And then we see the Spirit of God coming down upon him, and God saying, This is my beloved Son, and whom I love, please hear ye him. Amen. We shouldn't make too little of baptism, and I think we're sometimes guilty of it, but 
We also shouldn't make too much of it that we make it equal to salvation. We know to, to be baptized, we are identifying ourselves with Christ, with his suffering, with his death, with his resurrection. <coughs> so in it, we are really making an outward profession of our faith, if you will. An outward showing that we have truly died to sin. Amen. It is to the type or a figure, but it is a very important one in the Christian faith. That we, you know, there are some today that baptize babies, but babies cannot make a profession of faith. Amen. They liken them to the Old Testament circumcision. We cannot make our children partakers of the covenant by baptism. You're right. No, baptism is a sign of the new covenant, but it's not like a sign of the old covenant. There are many similarities, many ways they are the same, but yet we are children of God, and children of Abraham even, by faith, he says. We are not, that is where the difference comes in. It's a, mm -hmm. Not the physical seed of Abraham, but the spiritual seed, if you will. So this, this baptism, it really is a type and a shadow of that our old man is dying, that we are given a new life, that we've been made a new man, just as Christ was buried and rose again glorified. In that. And we'll experience the fullness of that one day when, we'll, when we put off this corruptible body, put on an incorruptible body. But in the inward man, we have already put off the old man and have been given a new man. And baptism is us saying that we have experienced this. That's why we, he says here that we are baptized into his death. And we are saying that we have fully experienced all that Christ died for. Amen. Well, I'm going to close this here with that. But we pick up next time, Lord willing, we'll see how that not only were we baptized into his death, but also into his resurrection. Amen. Christ didn't just die, but he also resurrected. We didn't just die in Christ, but we were also resurrected in him. So we're going to close with that thought. Amen. Amen.